welcome to you all. We've got what I hope is a um, provocative but actually pretty topical question to ask today, and that is, is international law dead? And maybe what better place to discuss it than here in Geneva at Geneva's Graduate Institute with experts and with students as well. Um, to welcome our panel, we have here Professor Andrew Clapham. Some of you probably know him, Professor of International Law here at the Graduate Institute. We have Christina Figueras Shah, a student here. Very important, I think, to get the, the younger generation to comment on a body of law, much of which is getting on for a century old. And we have the quiet but valiant, I guess, guardian of the Geneva Conventions here. That is Laurent Giesel, and he's head of the Arms Unit and Conduct of Hostilities at the International Committee of the Red Cross. We're going to talk for about 25 minutes to half an hour. Then we will gladly take some of your questions and then we will go back to summing up. The whole event should last about an hour. I'll be here afterwards if any of you have any questions just to me or to Joe, for example, about the podcast, please don't hesitate to approach us. Well, let's kick off first. I've got a really basic question. It's maybe too basic sometimes for a Geneva audience, but not for our listeners across the world. Um, and I'm going to start with you, Andrew Clapham. What does international law actually mean to you as a person, as an academic? Oh, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's my life. <laughs> uh, so it's obviously difficult for me to, to be too critical about human, uh, so about international law or human rights law or humanitarian law, because that's what I do. Um, what does it mean in terms of like a big worldview? I suppose it's considered by some of the people that I read and, and my worldview would be that it's a way of avoiding chaos uh, between states. So it's a bit different from national law in that it, it works to control how sovereign states behave, but also at their behest. But it's a better way of organizing things than if we didn't have international law. I suppose the point of a podcast like this and this discussion is that that's very abstract and dry. And today, people think of international law and they think of something that is going to bring justice and that is going to stop violence. And so I think it's a crucial moment for international law because the big question is, can it live up to those expectations? Very good question. I don't think we'll get a, a definitive answer to that in the course of an hour. But Lauren Giesel, I'm going to come to you next. Your organisation is one that, that springs to many people's minds around the world when we think about upholding international law and the Geneva Conventions. Andrew said it's, it's kind of a, between us and, and chaos. Is that how you see it? I certainly think that's a very important element of international law in general. And um, as a, in a way, a private person as well, beside the professional aspect to it, uh, it's actually, it's behind a lot of our daily work and daily, uh, not all, sorry, our daily life, whatever uh, we do that has an international aspect to it, even a phone call, um, uh, you know, buying things online, etc. All of that below it, there is some international law. So to speak on the title of the panel, definitely it's not dead. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Now, of course, a big aspect of uh, international law is the interstate question and the international relation questions that uh, Andrew mentioned. From more perspective, of course, at uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross is international humanitarian law. Uh, um, and uh, that's extremely important part of uh, international law. And that's what it means to me professionally. I deal with that uh, every day. Uh, um, so the purpose of that specific body of law in international law is to put some uh, standard of humanity in armed conflict. Uh, armed conflict is always horrifying, always horrible, always uh, creating death, injury uh, and destructions. But international humanitarian law aims to limit that and keep a level of humanity in it. And as we are here in Geneva, uh, uh, the basic uh, international treaty for that, uh, uh, for international humanitarian law as the four Geneva Conventions, which were ratified and adopted here uh, 75 years ago. So it's this year, the 75th anniversary. There are plenty of other 
treaties that have been developed afterwards that we can maybe also talk to you later. Additional protocols, lots of humanitarian disarmament treaties, extremely important. So it's a living body of law, definitely not a dead one. In your view, I'm interested in the views of the of the younger generation, Christina. Laurent says it's definitely not, not dead, but he did point out we're, we're marking the 75th anniversary of the Geneva Convention. 75 years is a long time ago. It's it, Coincidentally, some people know it's the 80th anniversary of D-Day today, and um, that is something we're told that we should also remember. And it was that moment in 1945, that never again moment, that gave birth to a lot of our international law. Do you... Does that seem a long way away to your generation? Do you do you do you still see the relevance, or is it uh, that was for another mm -hmm. era? Um, what I would say is that there is for sure two answers for that question. Uh, if we think about here in International Geneva, for example, uh, the youth here, and of course us as students <laughs> of the Graduate Institute, is uh, we still think is very relevant. Um, and we still think that even though it has problems, so for example, one problem that we think a lot is about how to enforce international law uh, and how to make the states uh, that we know they are sovereign to uh, abide a little bit more than they are doing now. Um, but at the same time, for example, I'm from Brazil. And if we talk with uh, a person of my age on, on their 20s and ask about international law, they would be like, oh, it's not something useful at all. It's not something that we deal in our country. Um, and that's not relevant for our context, which um, I don't agree, but I, I completely understand the point of view because sometimes um, it feels very far from what we are facing and it feels very far and detached with our problems there. So one thing that I, I would definitely say that is not that for sure, but it needs to be rethink a little bit more. So we need to rethink about how international law can be a little bit more um, appealing and it makes more sense to our generation. Laura, I'm going to come to you and then to, then to you, Andrew, to, to respond to that. Um, the ICRC talks privately, confidential bilateral discussions, I think is what you always call it, reminding, reminding warring parts of the Geneva Conventions, but we never hear about that. So it would be useful maybe for us to hear how, if it's effective, give us an example of how it's effective. You know, show us that this international law that we're talking about is more than just fine words on paper. It is applied by parties to conflicts and militaries every day all over the world. It works, uh, definitely. It works when a soldier uh, directs its attack at a military, which they do more often than directing an attack at civilians, which is prohibited by the law. Uh, it works when we deliver Red Cross messages, so messages that we collect, for example, from detainees and then bring them to their families to bring them news. And uh, that's just a piece of paper. But it's extremely important, just to give you uh, one personal uh, uh, experience, that I uh, delivered one Red Cross message in a remote village in a country in conflict. And then uh, I couldn't speak with the person because of language barriers, so we had translator, but I immediately saw the uh, person to whom I was giving the Red Cross message starting to cry. Why? Because that was not just news from the uh, the son uh, uh, of that father, but it actually news that the son was alive, which he didn't know for the last nine months, uh, uh, and was in anguish to know what had occurred to his son and whether he was actually dead. So it works. It does work. Uh, I've seen that also in place of detention that I visited and that my colleagues visit all over the world, world uh, every day, uh, that uh, that can make a difference, definitely. Now, there are also definitely uh, violations uh, of international humanitarian law in many conflicts that are today very much under scrutiny, and it's great that they are under scrutiny. The worst would be that uh, we forget that, uh, we disregard the fact that we don't talk about the fact that it's violated. It's great that it's so much discussed and so much, because that gives hope that things can change. Andrew, you've served on 
UN human rights investigation, particularly in, in, in South Sudan. Um, but that's more to, in some ways, to document the violations that are going on rather than uphold the law. So I'm interested also in hearing from you, how does it work? I mean, particularly in a context like that, how is it applied? Does, is it effective at all? I mean, you're right. At first glance, writing down all the violations that have happened seems a rather weak form of law. Um, we should be more interested in enforcing the law, even preventing the violations. But I like to think um, that over those six years, uh, by being known for uh, actually documenting what's going on, whilst one must give some people pause for thought that they don't want to get onto the list of people who have violated international law. They don't want to get onto a sanctions list so that they can't travel. They don't want to get into a situation where their assets are seized for having been accused of violating international law. So the fact of talking about the violation, as Laurent was rather hinting, can give rise to compliance because people choose not to attack civilians. People choose not to use child soldiers. I was in a meeting last week um, where people were sharing experience and it seems that there are some groups that are choosing no longer to use child soldiers, precisely not to get accused of committing that war crime or getting onto the Secretary General's list. So rather than focusing on the sort of flagrant violations, I think it's important to see this as a framework which tells people, yes, how to behave. And that gives people the chance to avoid misbehaving, to put it gently, and to avoid being labelled a war criminal. And I think the, the events of the last few months uh, have highlighted for people that naming somebody as a potential war criminal has a huge effect. And I would like to sort of maybe stress here the secondary effects, because if the leader is named as a war criminal, like President Putin or Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, that means that assisting them to do what they're doing means that you are aiding and assisting potentially in a war crime. So it gives everybody notice that uh, cooperation with somebody or a state that's involved in violations of international law can bring responsibility to you too. And I think that's um, actually an important, not just educative effect, but I think it's actually preventing some of the violence um, which otherwise would go on. I mean, to put it brutally, it's preventing some arms transfers which are happening mm -hmm. because judges are able to say, I can now see that there is a risk that these arms would be used in a war crime. Therefore, the arms can't be transferred. And that, that's the case of um, what happened in the Dutch Court of Appeal with regards to the pieces for the F-35s. So that's a very concrete example of how international law is in action and very much alive. Okay, we're going to come on a little bit more to the current uh, tussles, if you like, over, over international law and the role of, of, uh, of international courts in a moment. But Christina, I wanted to ask you again, I don't mean to say, oh, you're, you're the young person, you have to represent <laughs> all young people, but you are young. Um, and I'm interested in, you're, you're also kind of the, the post 9-11 generation. And the ICRC did a study uh, two or three years back, maybe a couple more than that, where it, it asked young people their views on different aspects of international law, and particularly the, the, the total prohibition on torture. Now, a significant proportion of younger people in developed countries in the United States and, and, and Britain said they thought torture was permissible if it brought results, if it prevented terrorism. Now, you're saying when you talk to your friends in, in Brazil that they also don't necessarily see uh, international laws especially useful. What would, you, what would you say to them to change their minds? Mm. Or would they say to mm -hmm. you, ah, you've been in Geneva too long? <laughs> I think that will be the first answer that they will, <laughs> they will do for me. Like too, too much time in Europe <laughs> changed you. But, um, but actually, um, I think I will try to explain to them how, of course, it's not perfect with international law, but without all the conventions that we have, for example, it would be very hard to actually get to some outcomes or to get uh, the right people to get arrested, for example. So um, in South America, in Brazil, I can talk a little bit more in depth about it. Uh, we also have problems with torture and um, in institutional aspects in different times 
of our history. And for sure, we can address those types of problems uh, through the international conventions if um, we have them. So I think one of the main things that I would talk is not only about how we can see a baseline of how a state or a person or a leader can act or not uh, in terms of um, legality, but yes, like how, how it's better to have the international law with us and maybe try to transform that instead of only criticizing it. And we can think a little bit beyond and try to educate ourselves as well, because what I would say is that if you're not work with international law specifically in Brazil, you barely know about it. Mm -hmm. It's very different than the reality here in Geneva. So we need to educate our youth to understand what uh, international law can do, what cannot do, and then start rethinking of possible ways of making it more effective. In a way, I think you're, when you say you need to raise awareness, that's also a, cert a responsibility of political and civic leaders, um, which takes me kind of to my, my next question. Is Sorry, Andrew, Imogen, yeah. can, can, can yes, I jump in on the Yes, please do. You're, a, you're, you're all allowed to jump in. Because um, you did invite <laughs> us to. Yes, you were invited to. I mean, I now. think, uh, as has been said, this torture point mm. is very contextual. So if you ask a bunch of British or American young people, they think that the torture is going to happen to somebody else. <laughs> And it's going to save Certainly them. Certainly never them. Yeah. Um, and there was a series of horrific TV programs after 9-11. I'm thinking particularly of 24 and Jack Bauer. Mm. Some people might have seen it. Where torture was the solution to everything. But it was always being done to the foreigners. Um, and, and of course, so I'm not surprised that you could find a group of people who say, yeah, maybe torture is a good idea. And I've met some of those people. But of course, if you had asked a group of Syrians or a group of Myanmar people, they would have said, um, absolutely, we are are against torture and it never leads to anything good and it's the most horrific thing. So I think we should be careful about saying, you know, well, torture can be a, a useful thing and it's a rather outdated idea. For the people who are liable to get subjected to torture, it's the most horrific idea. And there's this rather unfortunate idea that, yes, but it's okay because it will never be us, um, some people are thinking. It will always be the other. And it sort of leads to this dehumanization of the enemy. And I think it's something that... Uh, I feel strongly about that we should never be contemplating this idea that you could instrumentalize another human being in order to achieve your goals. So I think it's very important that intellectuals push back against this idea, even if we're not the ones who are likely to be tortured. Um, and it seems rather tempting. I, th I think that's a really important point. And Laurent, correct me if I'm wrong, and you, you maybe do want to come in here, that that study that you did, this weird, you know, not very encouraging support for torture, um, was at zero levels in countries in conflict or in repressive regimes? I don't remember the specific of the studies, but definitely I can't agree more with what uh, uh, Andrew just mentioned in terms of making it concrete and thinking uh, uh, about what would it be if it occurred to me, if it occurred to uh, my family, my loved ones. Mm -hmm. And then I think the answer is extremely clear. And what it made this uh, study also made us rethink and redouble efforts and to link with what another point that um, Andrew, you just mentioned, which is prevention uh, uh, and uh, linked to how international law and international humanitarian law in particular works today. There is a lot of things beyond discussing with parties to the conflict that aims to prevent in the first place. And lots of unknown work in terms of creating domestic law that implement national law. So bring humanitarian law into domestic law, bring humanitarian law into military manuals, into military trainings, to make sure that everything is in place in the unfortunate event of the country being involved in an armed conflict. And that's something we also do all over the world and where we see that it works, to come back to your initial questions, because we see that uh, states adopt uh, laws and adopt manuals that implement it and that when we also discuss with them, they uh, might change what they had planned or well, we have discussions also on how to best implement it in national law, which is very important whether it's for the prohibition of torture or whether it's for any other rules of uh, international law. Okay. Um, that is, again, very heartening 
to see that, you know, the stuff we don't hear about, we see the headlines and so on, but the stuff we don't hear about, that some of this stuff is actually working. But I wanted to come back to the, the point I was beginning to address, which is about political leadership, civic leadership. We had um, a, a statement from the elders. Some of you may know them. It's former senior UN people, Ban Ki-moon, um, former UN Secretary General, Zaid Rad al-Hussein, former Human Rights Commissioner, a group of people who have led international diplomacy over the past uh, two to three decades. And they put a statement out this week telling political leaders that they were pretty much um, they needed to show more leadership, otherwise we risk losing the international order. And that they basically mean the standards we have set ourselves. Now, Andrew, you talked about um, how political leaders, they do fight. We see it here in Geneva, tooth and nail, not to be named and shamed, not to come under sanctions. Um, but at the same time, we do, well, I wonder from all of you whether you think this is a growing tendency or it's always been like this. A kind of tendency to um, politicise international law in the sense that um, if it's if criticism is directed against me or my mates, well, it, I don't believe in this law. If it's directed against somebody I currently happen to not like, then it's fine. Um, and I wonder, because we had a lot of questions, and I'm sure you do too, we had quite a lot of questions online ahead of this about double standards. I'm going to come to you first, Christina. Do you do you think that's something we see from elected leaders now that it, it's treated more as a tool than a universal standard? Being very personal in my answer, um, I would say that, at least from my experience, um, it seems a growing um, topic and a growing. Uh, we are growing towards double standards at least a little bit more we can see um more polarization in uh within the international scenario and i would actually agree a little bit with the fact that there are indeed double standards uh in how we treat some types of um violations and some other types of violations but also we know that um the main uh, concept of double standards is actually getting politicized as well. So it is a, is a way to um, get away from some types of violations that the person might be like facing as well. I don't know if maybe Professor Kaipan will have like a better answer on that topic, but yes. <laughs> what do you think, Andrew? I mean, we've seen the classic, which I'm sure everybody's got at the top of their minds right now, is the... Um, the, the huge support from America, from Europe, to condemn Russia for what anybody here in this room would say are clear violations of international law, including violating the UN Charter in the first place by um, invading Ukraine. But then with Israel and Gaza, and I'm aware this is a very polarised topic, but there, although... There is certainly a strong case, I would think, to say that there are questions over whether international law is being upheld. These same countries are very hesitant. And it seems to many people to be more to do with geopolitics than it is to do with what the actual law says. And I would go even further. They're not just hesitant, they're downright antagonistic. So while um, US authorities welcomed the arrest warrant for President Putin and welcomed the work of the International Criminal Court, we now have a situation where the same politicians are saying this International Criminal Court has to be sanctioned, this is ridiculous, and not just uh, questioning whether the two uh, individuals on both sides have actually violated international law, but whether an International Criminal Court should exist at all, um, and calling for all kinds of uh, ridiculous sanctions against the International Criminal Court, the same court which was seen to be doing a good job before. So, I mean, double standards doesn't quite capture it. <laughs> double speak okay. doesn't quite capture it. Um, it's, it's really quite bizarre. Um, I could get a little more technical just because some of the uh, listeners might, might be interested. I mean, when uh, President Putin uh, was, uh, the arrest warrant was confirmed by the International Criminal Court, nobody said anything about the fact that Russia was not a state party um, to the ICC statute. But for Israel now, a lot of the antagonism says, oh, but you can't do this because Israel is not a state party. But the same rules apply to both. They're involved in countries that are under the jurisdiction of the court. 
So it's quite blatant that um, when we like what the International Criminal Court is doing, we will support it. But as soon as it steps out of line, we'll call it a ridiculous institution. So it is a, a bit of a crossroads for international law, and I firmly believe that these institutions will continue. But it, it's a reminder that international law, um, it's the same law, it's the Geneva Conventions, it applies to everybody. And the fact that you don't like it when your friends are accused it doesn't mean that the law doesn't actually apply to it. And uh, giving that example, I think, uh, again, international law is alive and kicking. Laurent, I know the ICRC is not going to comment on, on you know, the more politicised rights and wrongs, or in public anyway, the conflict, but I just wonder whether there is concern um, within the ICRC at what looks a bit like a kind of pick and choose of international law. It applies to you because you're not my mate, but it doesn't apply to me or my mate over there. That would be indeed very concerning, and that's something that we are uh, looking at every day, definitely. But that, uh, to start, uh, to take a step back, uh, I think it's important to underscore that humanitarian law applies universally, uh, and fully universally in the sense that every state have ratified the Geneva Convention. Uh, uh, and one very particular element of humanitarian law is that it also applies to non-state parties to armed conflict. Uh, it binds in, in civil wars, what is called in the law non-international armed conflict. So when a state fight against insurgents, against rebels, against a group that they might call terrorists, international humanitarian law applies and bind both the states and the non-state armed group. So in that sense, the same rule applies to all. Uh, that speaks to the absence, in the law at least, of double standards, but treating all the same. And that's critically important. Now, it's indeed critically important that states apply it also when it concerns themselves and when it concerns their allies, as you mentioned earlier. And uh, that's something we stress very much with states currently. Uh, all the more that in every conflict currently, uh, the parties to armed conflict, whether that's a state or a non-state armed group, they are supported by others. They are supported by other states. Non-state armed group are supported by states. And whether that's through political support, economic support, direct arm transfer, as Andrew mentioned before, uh, or otherwise, with arms transfer, there are specific rules that uh, you mentioned, and that speaks to IHL uh, humanitarian law being a living body of law, because the arms trade treaty is only a decade old, which for treaties is very recent. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so it continues developing. Uh, um, but uh, even if it's not about weapons transfer, the fact that you have influence on a party to the conflict, whether that's a state or a non-state armed group, that's an influence that you can use to actually uh, uh, ensure respect for international humanitarian law. Encourage, uh, uh, use your influence to encourage respect to, for international humanitarian law. That's very much something that we also discuss. We call on state publicly to do that uh, in a general manner, and we also discuss that uh, bilaterally, uh, in what we call humanitarian diplomacy. So doing that uh, bilateral discrete work, not only with parties to the conflict, but also with whoever can influence them towards a better respect for the law. I'm just wondering, though, you, you talked about arms trade treaty that's only 10, 10, 10 years old, and there's other parts of international law that are relatively new. We also know that it's quite interesting, Mon, the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, a lot of countries took a long time to ratify it. A lot still haven't. We did have quite a few questions also online about, about in, under international law, how, do chil how are children protected? Um, Christina, you first. Do you see a, a pressure between the sovereignty of a, of a state, say your own Brazil or mine, Britain, where Politicians say, you don't need to tell us how to do this. We can look after our children. Or, of course, we're responsible with arms trade. Why do, We don't need to sign a treaty. We're fine as we are. Um, I think definitely there is a, a little bit of um, sovereignty discourse as we talk about the rights of children. But at the same time, um, there is a convention. And, for example, in my case in Brazil, uh, we uh, we have our own domestic convention that also um, applies the international convention of children's rights. So we we can see that there is at the same time 
um, the domestic sovereignty, but we try to make the rights of children the most important thing. Uh, we have a lot of like policies, public policies on um, how to, for example, famine is a problem in our country that is growing, unfortunately, in the past five years, uh, especially among children in vulnerable positions in the north of our country and from indigenous descent. And yeah, there is quite specific and it's related to previous uh, governmental choices uh, that we had in the past uh, that are also, for example, our ex-president, uh, he has international charges against him in related to genocide of um, indigenous communities. And, and maybe um, you, Lohan and Professor Kapham can talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, but yes, I feel that at least for now, the current government uh, is trying to make the protection of children the top priority. It doesn't matter um, what children, you know, like what ethnicity and uh, in what conditions. So, yes. Andrea, I saw you nodding there. I'm just wondering if you also see this, that increasingly some governments see international law as kind of mission creep that they don't they just don't need it I or is that just populist is that just election talk i think you just put your finger on it i think it's populist election talk um i was reading my english paper this morning and i noticed that there was a government minister saying that they would put in the conservative manifesto probably the idea of leaving the european mm. court of human rights i mean if you put it now in the context of an election it's a way of getting votes um, or not. Or not. Um, I lived through some of the discussions here in Switzerland uh, about foreign judges mm. and the political manoeuvres, again more recently after the climate change case, uh, to not just sanction the European Court of Human Rights, but to start again this discussion about Switzerland leaving or the UK leaving. And it's seen as, as you quite rightly say, foreign interference, but often... There are a lot of, um, I, I used the word when I was talking about this, mensonge, uh, lies uh, about the court. If you go through some of the propaganda that the populist parties put out about the European Court of Human Rights and you follow up the cases, they're often distorted to make it sound as though the European Court of Human Rights has ensured that an incredibly violent person has been allowed to stay on Swiss territory or UK territory. When, in fact, when you go through the details of the case, it's really rather different. So um, it's a popular demon, uh, international courts, whether it's the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice, the Gouvernement des Juges Etrangers. All of this is designed, in my view, to sort of whip up support for particular parties. And I think we have nothing to fear from international courts. It's my view. But of course, I'm a little biased. I've worked with these courts. <laughs> I've even been true. on the secretariat <laughs> of some of these bodies. Um, and so I come from the sort of internationalist Geneva perspective, guilty as charged. Yes, well, we mm -hmm. probably all are sitting mm -hmm. on the same, in the same dock on that one. But um, it is, you've been very patient, time to turn to you for questions. Um, so we've heard about political manipulation of international law. We've heard about why it is relevant from people who work on the ground trying to uphold it. And we've heard about... Uh, the younger generation and whether they're committed to it, whether they see it's, it's relevant. Um, over to you. Do you have any questions to our panel? You've mentioned a little bit about how um, armed groups are avoiding use of child soldiers. We've heard about uh, military manuals incorporating international law. But I wonder if you look at any of the major conflicts of the last 50 years, uh, you know, Balkans, Chechnya, Iraq, and all the conflicts that we have currently. Um, can you sh give examples of how international law has actually reined in the conduct of hostilities? Mm -hmm. I think this is, this is a very good question because I think it, it's, it's the one thing you could use to convince people who are saying, oh, it's just a bunch of do-gooders, do-gooding lawyers writing papers. Um, and maybe I'll start with the ICRC. <laughs> Go on. Little rain, rainings in, small ones we don't know about. It, it's, uh, armed conflicts are always horrible. 
Let's be clear on that in the first place. They are horrible, even if they would be perfect respect for humanitarian law. Armed conflict as such is a horrible phenomenon that is created by human beings that should be prevented in the first place. And that states and the international community should work on that and find political solutions to that, especially for long-lasting conflicts. Uh, uh, now, so the fact that it has been horrible <coughs> over the last 50 years uh, uh, is not only, at least, a failure of international humanitarian law. There are many other aspects to it. Uh, um, now, with regard to international humanitarian law, whether it has reigned in, yes, uh, every day. Uh, every day in conflicts, you have military who do collateral damage assessments, so uh, as military say, so meaning before doing a strike, uh, uh, assessing how many civilian casualties they expect, uh, <coughs> assessing whether they expect to uh, uh, incidentally damage uh, hospitals or uh, an electricity station or uh, the house of a family. And they do that every day. Mm, uh, so that's definitely reigning in uh, uh, what uh, they would do otherwise. Whether that's sufficient, whether that's sufficiently well done, uh, uh, whether that's sometimes uh, uh, disregarded, of course, there are issues in that respect. And uh, respect for humanitarian law needs to be improved. Uh, um, and that's linked to political decisions. Let's be clear, uh, uh, political decisions on whether or not to uh, respect uh, the law. And that's why the political aspect that you mentioned before, um, Imagine, uh, uh, is so important, uh, not only with regards to uh, uh, political and civilian leadership, with regard to their own uh, uh, troops, but also from other states. But uh, uh, definitely it makes a difference and it has made a difference in the conflict over the last 50 years. It will not make conflict human, for sure. Conflict in and of itself is an inhuman matter. Andrew? I'm going to choose one example um, of landmines. So the, the sort of push by civil society to have a landmine ban treaty um, was obviously successful. In, in fact, the landmine ban treaty doesn't actually, on its words, cover the non-state actors that are fighting um, against states. And yet the sort of feeling that this is again to international law, I'm sort of choosing my words so as not to be sort of thought to be legally illiterate, led to a number of armed groups um, refusing to use landmines because they didn't want to be seen going against the international norm. And perhaps, you know, you're asking for concrete examples. I mean, through the work of groups like Geneva Call, those same uh, armed groups or non-state actors uh, or, or rebel groups chose to destroy their stockpiles of landmines so that they couldn't fall into the hands of other armed groups or be used again when there was a change of leadership. So if you're sort of looking for sort of ratchet effects changes, I think there is a diminishing use of landmines amongst some of those groups. And it's not just because they ran out of money or they couldn't get hold of them. It's because of this normative sense that there's something wrong with it and it's delegitimizing because of the, the role of international law. So without the landmine treaty and without those meetings about landmines, you wouldn't have this push. Uh, cluster munitions is another topic, but again, if you, if you look at the, the debate around the transfer of cluster munitions to Ukraine and so on, international law was playing a role. It didn't necessarily always stop it, but um, every time a weapon which is on this sort of borderline of is it acceptable or not, uh, gets used or is reported to be used, we have this discussion. And the international legal pull against using them, I think, has an effect, yes. Laurent, you wanted to come in there. Uh, that's a very powerful example for non-state armed group, as you mentioned, also for states, and it's uh, measurable with the number of victims going down tenfold compared to before the treaty was in place. The number of civilian victims of mines has been uh, divided by 10. Uh, uh, but there are also everything that we see less and don't make headlines, and again, it's the preventive aspect to it, probably little much less people know about uh, the prohibition of blinding laser weapons mm -hmm. than the mine bans treaty. Why? Because it has been prohibited before they were developed and it was prohibited 50 years ago. So one effect of humanitarian law over the, la the 50 years of the conflict uh, to, for your questions is that there was no blinding laser weapons ever being deployed because those were not developed.
that's a very concrete example that we don't speak so much about. We speak much more about the uh, mine treaty, but preventing it is even better. Imagine if the uh, land mine treaty had been adopted before mines had been industrially produced how much even more it would have made of a difference uh, in terms of preventing all the thousands and thousands and thousands of civilian deaths and injured combatants. But we would talk about it very little, uh, um, like uh, the uh, Blinding Laser Weapons Treaty. Uh, um, so that's, uh, that's key and that's something that continues developing. Uh, um, the weapons treaty that prohibits uh, uh, specific types of the most horrible weapons uh, uh, have evolved since 1980 continuously, on average every five years. And the latest one is the prohibition of uh, the treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, Finally, having also a treaty for that last uh, weapons of mass destructions after the prohibition of chemical and biological weapons. So that's the most recent one, and it continues. And today's situation show how relevant it is. Christine, are you reassured by this? Because at, at the moment, I mean, I, I agree that these two examples, they are very positive ones. But what we see on our on our TV screens, and maybe that's the fault of my profession, but what we see is what looks like deliberate attempts to terrify the civilian population. We've seen in Ukraine the attack of, of uh, attacks on power supplies, uh, denial of aid access. We're seeing this in, in, uh, in Gaza as well, uh, restricted aid, um, what looked like disproportionate attacks on civilians, and I'm, uh, denial of food and water. I mean, I'm just wondering, is, is that, oh my God, people are just not respecting them, or is it good that we're reporting on them because we actually know we maybe we know our international law better than we thought um i would agree um with professor clapham about how there is a change of normative and a behavioral change so for example maybe 50 years ago or 60 years ago we will not um think or we as society will not um discuss about those types of human rights violations in the same way. So I do think that is something important that um, now we have those because of we have the normatives and we have the law. Um, at least my generation or young generations are tolerate much less those types of violation and we are reporting more. So I think this is also something with social media and the new types of media that we have more information about the violations that are going on so we can um, be more vocal about it even though that we are far away physically from um, from the, the places of violation but at the same time i also know that it's an ongoing problem i think like the problem is still there that um, many parts of conflicts non-state are um, uh, non-state actors or state actors, they do not um, apply the humanitarian law and they do not follow uh, the basic human rights laws that, that are here established almost a century. And so, yes, it's, it's a very tricky question, I would say, mm -hmm. but yeah, that would be my answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, more questions? Ah, you, sir. Wait to wait for the microphone to come to you. Um, Thank you very much. Um, I heard the mention of torture and prevention. Uh, I work at the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights on prevention of torture, so I was very much delighted to hear both present at this discussion. Um, and it reminded me of the discourse of the late um, Kofi Annan and Boutros Boutros Ghali on the preventive aspect of the work of the United Nations and how um, lots and lots and lots of conflicts and catastrophes that we don't hear about have been prevented by the force of the United Nations and the multilateral system. Um, but what comes out is what ca has not been able to be prevented. Um, and in that sense, I wanted to shift the, the topic to multilateral system as I work in it and our faith in it is on the line. Um, we see that the United Nations is being choked, um, liquidity crisis, enough to walk around in the Palais des Nations, you see uh, empty rooms, uh, oh, escalators off, dark too and dark, cold. <laughs> um, states sanctioning UN officials, um, closing down our offices, 
200 of our personnel killed in only one conflict in the past few months. My question is, are we close to the fourth turning and the uh, and faith for the United Nations similar to that of the League of, League of Nations, in your opinion? Well, that Thanks. is a topic for a whole other podcast, isn't it, mm-hmm. really? In, in, in summing up, it's not entirely dissimilar from yours, is that um, we have this international law which is supposed to be universal without fear or favour, for the poor as well as the rich, for the powerful as well as the weak, and that the powerful can't evade it, no matter how powerful they are. And we talked about the crisis of the multilateral system in a very practical way, like the Palais des Nations is a bit, you know, of a ghost building at the moment, a noisy, dusty ghost building because they're renovating it. Um, I just, as a summing up, because we are coming to the end, and I'll start uh, with you, Andrew. Um, What... Briefly, would you say to the powerful who still call the shots, yeah, it's in your interest, it's in all our interests, why, do, why we need the international law and to a certain extent the multilateral system? Convince, yeah, it's great. So, so I'm Trump, convince me. Well, <laughs> I mean, I know I, it's I'm not a stretch, but speak to you as I would speak to Trump. I think <laughs> <laughs> not for public broadcasting, <laughs> but um, no. I mean, I think uh, today's problems clearly require multilateral solutions and international cooperation. If you want to talk about preventing a future pandemic, if you want to um, ensure that we deal with climate justice, if you want to tackle issues of migration. All of these issues are going to have to be resolved by states talking to each other and finding ways to cooperate. I mean, we have the metaphor of the escalators being switched off in the Palais des Nations, but I was actually yesterday with somebody and I told them I was going to be doing this talk about, you know, is international law dead? And they came from the WTO. They said the WTO park car park has never been fuller. There has never been more activity. The fact that it's not resulting in treaties that you read about on the front page of uh, Tribune de Genève is, is not the point, because people have to organize moving around of medical equipment, moving around of essential drugs, dealing with cholera, all of these questions, patents on medicines. So there will be international cooperation. And at a certain point, the powerful can step away from that and they can use their muscle to say, I'm not joining this treaty. But the world will move on. And I think it's in their interests. I've been in enough treaty negotiations to realize that powerful states, they need to be involved because they want the world order to be fixed in their interest. And they don't always get their way. I'll stop there. Christina, so I'm not Donald, now I'm Baron Trump. (laughs) What would you say to him, a teenager? This is a a billionaire teenager. This is actually really relevant to you too. (laughs) Um, I think I would like tell him to read history a little bit more. Um, because we need to go back to how um, the international system was before we had all the international law treaties to understand the importance of them now and to understand what our generation can do to improve it instead of just um, demining it or just thinking as uh, referring back to, to my friends and colleagues back in Brazil, useless or not um, not that important anymore in today's world. We know that it's a, um, it's a still international law. The main way in international cooperation, as Professor Kaplan said, that we can prevent n- future conflicts and future pandemics and um, future international problems that we need to. The world nowadays is much more close together and globalized. So um, it's not that likely that One country is facing one problem and it will stick in that one country. So I think we should go back, understand all the reasons why we got um, to this point at first place of how we uh, wrote all the international treaties and understand from that on what our generation can do to improve it. Pretty much the same question to you, Laurent, but maybe focused on the Geneva Conventions, because my great grandma knew what they were. She was trying to find out where her husband was in the war. Um, But almost a century on, it seems less. How would you convince people this? You could need this. This you, you you do need it, and you could really need it personally at some point. 
I very much agree with you, uh, Christina, with regard to looking at history. The Geneva Convention, as you say, they are 75 years old, 49, that's just after the Second World War. And that was based on the experience of the Second World War, which, of course, is the most horrible conflict that we ever seen with the most uh, um, um, violations of anything that you can think of with uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction being used. So it's the big power to point back to your questions on how you um, uh, convince the, the strong ones. They decided to make the Geneva Convention because they learned from the Second World War. And today's big powers should think and remember that The Geneva Convention and humanitarian law have been designed for high-intensity conflicts. Uh, they are meant to apply there and to reduce uh, and prevent the most horrible aspect of it. So that's the first uh, part of the answer. Then the second part of the answer, uh, uh, maybe tying into um, uh, your question on what's the win-win. Uh, um, and uh, of course, complying with international humanitarian law, uh, uh, you have all reasons to do that uh, because it's the law. And uh, you don't want to break the law, you don't want to be a war criminal. We have discussed that earlier. You have all reasons to want to do that because you reduce suffering. Uh, uh, so that uh, bring a little bit more humanity in a horrible situation. And then you need to think about the future and that's where also I see the win-win. That helps peace. If you respect humanitarian law during uh, the conflict, uh, it will be less difficult to make peace afterwards. Mm, uh, at all levels, both in terms of reconstructions and living, uh, if you have uh, less destructions of civilian infrastructure, if you have less territory that has been mined, uh, uh, it's easy for economic recovery, which of course helps as well. And it also helps avoid too much hatred. Of course, conflicts create hatred, but violation of international humanitarian law creates even more hatred. And if you want to live in peace afterwards, uh, uh, that helps to uh, respect international humanitarian law during the conflicts. Thank you very much. Well, that brings us to the end of this panel discussion. I hope we've convinced you all that not only is international law not dead, but it remains hugely relevant to every single one of us, both in here and out there and all around the world. My thanks to our panelists, Andrew, Christina and Laurel. To you for turning up. You can hear the podcast next week online, um, wherever you get your podcasts, as they say. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you for joining us. That's it from Inside Geneva for this week. I'm here, Joe from Swiss Info is here, should you have any questions about that. But again, thank you for joining us. Thanks to the panelists. Thank you.